The British Empire was at its height at the turn of the 20th century and commanded near universal support domestically. Anti-colonialism as a movement wouldn't gain strength for several decades, while the strongest voices for it in both Britain and elsewhere were generally disconnected. Not so, says Priya Gopal in her book, Insurgent Empire, Anti-Colonial Resistance and British Descent. According to her, changing opinion about Britain's colonies at home and far away was far more than simply connected. In fact, it was often mutually constitutive and in dialogue. Priya, welcome to Navarra Media. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I always get worried about those introductions saying the complete opposite of what somebody else has written about because then they might get angry. Um, it's a. Uh, I think that was fine. Good. It was. Um, it was a real pleasure reading this book. Um, I mean, how long did it take you to to, to write? Because it's four hundred and fifty pages of extensive, often sort of you know, the data collection is phenomenal. It must have taken a really long time to to compile. It took about six years from well, five and a half years from start to finish. So yes, a, a, a lot of time. And if you had to explain it to somebody in a sort of as an elevator pitch over thirty seconds, what what would it be? Um, it's a kind of a counter history of empire uh, done through the question of resistance to empire and dissent in Britain around the question of empire. So it's really offering a kind of snapshot of the history of empire, but not from the point of view of agreement and hegemony and consensus, but from the point of view of dissent and resistance and opposition to the empire. And you start the book off with um, a few episodes of of rebellion, effectively. Uh, the first is what we call the Indian Mutiny, but I think you refer to it a few times as arguably India's first war of national liberation. I don't know what the precise words you use. Um, no, I the don't. I, I, uh, I, I refer to it as having been referred to in India as right. the first war of independence. In fact, I think that that's um, an exaggeration, and I think that that's uh, probably very retrospective, but it was certainly one of the most right. significant early uprisings. But your point is it wasn't just um, purely constitutive of sort of military dissent. It was a broader uprising across multiple yeah. states, across multiple classes. Yeah. Can, can you sort of outline the importance of, of the Indian mutiny in 1857 and, and the impact it had on changing attitudes to empire in Britain? So the most important thing to say about uh, the 1857 uprising, as I would call it, is that it was more than a mutiny. Um, it begins as a sepoy mutiny or a mutiny of foot soldiers in the British Indian Army, uh, but it very quickly spreads into the civilian population and it, uh, and it spreads across large swathes of northern and central India. So its importance is that it's not just um, soldierly rebellion as it was presented in Britain, but it actually became uh, something like a wide scale war. Um, and its importance, I think, lies in the fact that it was violent, um, but it also met with tremendous uh, repression and it met with a tremendous counterinsurgency. And it was one of the first major 19th century crises of rule for the British Empire. And as we know, of course, um, it ended the rule of the East India Company in India and the crown took over um, uh, rule. And that's the kind of formal inauguration of the British Raj in India. It's important, I think, for um, dissenters, because although there was a great deal of support uh, for the imperial administration in, in India, there was a great deal of condemnation uh, of what was described as the savagery of the rebels. Um, there were also people, most famously the Chartist Ernest Jones um, and uh, the positivist Richard Congreve um, and a few others who actually took the opportunity to offer solidarity uh, to those who were rebelling against the empire as opposed to throwing their weight behind the crown, behind the empire. So I kind of regard it as an early moment of uh, fomenting a degree of dissent in Britain around the question of empire. And you do get people coming out and saying um, that ordinary British people should identify with the rebelling Indians and not with the crown and not with the empire itself. How was that received by the sort of broader British public? The idea that somebody like Ernest Jones could say, actually, what, what these people are doing um, in, in South Asia is entirely legitimate. Well, what we know, I mean, what we know from the archives is that there were public meetings and there were um, broadsheets and, and pamphlets which were kind of raising 
uh, the issue of uh, who was doing what in India and for whose benefit uh, the empire was. It would be wrong to suggest that uh, there was widespread dissent uh, in Britain. For me, that moment is important because I think it, it signals the beginning of a tradition in Britain of dissent around the empire. So it's not as though Ernest Jones has a huge following. It's not as though um, Richard Congreve has a huge following. But these are people who uh, are trying to create ideological uh, alternatives and political alternatives in the British public sphere. We know, for instance, that Ernest Jones um, attended public meetings uh, along with British MPs uh, criticizing British rule in India, criticizing the actions undertaken during the ferocious counterinsurgency. So for me, the importance is not that it was it created widespread dissent around empire, but that it signals uh, an early moment in a tradition of dissenting around empire in Britain. And the reason I think that's important is we're often told, oh, you know, back in the day, everybody thought empire was or back in the day, nobody had a problem with uh, ferocious repression of insurgency. And I'm pointing out that that is simply not true, that for those uh, who were off a dissident bent, those who were off a critical bent, there were people who were critical uh, of the British Empire and what was being done in the name of British people uh, in India and in, in other parts um, of the British Empire. And to what extent did people like Ernest Jones or, or Congreve try and uh, show lines of continuity between the Indian uprising 1857 and, for instance, the revolutions of 1848? Obviously, this was a very turbulent, politically volatile yeah. moment in Europe as well. Often, you know, as I was reading what you know what you've written, I think, goodness, of course, there's there's a great deal of kind of uh, shared grievance here, antagonisms, change in uh, media consumption habits and so on, global communications patterns. But I never viewed the Indian mutiny as something which was within a broader context of European uprisings. Was that something that they also tried to articulate? Yes, they did. I mean, the as you say, 1848 is an important moment. 1857 is coming um, really at a time when the Chartist movement is running out of steam. And Ernest Jones uh, is trying to revive the fortune of dissident working class movements in Britain. And one of the interesting things about how he looks at the Indian uprising is that he looks at it um, as an inspirational moment. And instead of saying um, what we often hear people say that, you know, the Indians took inspiration from Britain, mm. he actually reverses the lines of influence. And he kind of tries to... Um, you know, uh, inspire and chide his working class readership and says, look, uh, the Indians are challenging capitalist exploitation. The Indians are, are challenging the exploitation and unjust taxation on peasants and workers. And we should be learning from them because let us recall that the same people who are profiting from empire and the same people who are doing the oppression and the bloodshed in India are the same people who are oppressing the working classes in Britain. So he's trying to kind of uh, revive the flagging fortunes because by 1857, the radical movements in Europe um, are on the flagging end. They're kind of running out of steam. They've been co-opted. They've been diffused. Uh, the energies are now moving in the direction of kind of liberal individualism and, and a certain kind of liberal hegemony. And he's trying to use the example of the Indian revolt as um, as a kind of radical resource, a radical alternative, which might inspire people in uh, Britain, in, you know, rather than the other way around. And speaking of uh, there being an influence of ideas in Europe from, in this instance, um, India and, and South Asia, uh, there was a significant influence exerted by Ernest Jones writing on the um, Indian uprising on Karl Marx and his understanding of colonialism and its relationship to capitalism. Can you can you briefly explain how that operated? Well, one thing that happens, I mean, there is, I think, some um, disagreement about the extent to which Marx might have been influenced by Jones. By 1857, uh, Marx and Jones are no longer close. They're no longer um, friends. Uh, that said, the academic theory Drapeau has argued that Marx's dispatches on 1857, which were serialized in the New York Tribune, uh, were significantly influenced by Ernest Jones's um, take on, on, on the uh, 
uh, uprising. I'm not entirely certain that that is the case. Uh, what is striking, I think, about Marx's engagement with the uprising, as opposed to Jones, um, Marx is clearly excited by the possibilities of what is happening uh, in India. He clearly uh, sees it as significant, but he doesn't engage with it with these quite the same sense of the agency of the oppressed in uh, India as Jones does. Jones is extremely clear uh, that what is happening in India is very significant for working class uh, movements in Britain and in Europe, and that it ha you know it has to have a certain kind of inspirational significance. Marx is a little bit uh, more, I would say, um, not detached, but he's not necessarily seeing it as having direct implications for working class movements uh, in uh, in Europe in or in or in Britain. Um, he's he is less, I think, engaged with anti-colonialism per se at this moment than he would be later on uh, in his career. That said, um, you know, we do know that Marx and Engels uh, were both uh, uh, invested in, in Chartism. They engaged with it. They were uh, reading the people's paper. So, you know, I think it's a question of uh, speculation. To what extent did Jones, in fact, um, influence Marx? But my preliminary sense is that Marx's dispatches on the uh, Indian rebellion are different in tone and tenor from Jones's uh, much more direct and much more enthusiastic engagement. There's a second episode some years after the uh, the Indian uprising you, you talk about, which is the Morant Bay Rebellion. Uh, at the centre of that is a gentleman called George William Gordon. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that rebellion, uh, Mr. Gordon himself, what happened to him and the kind of consequence it had politically in Britain? So the 1865 Morant Bay uprising was less than 10 years after the Indian uh, rebellion. And the Indian rebellion, let us remember, had had kind of traumatic um, implications for the British public sphere. It, it certainly, I mean, on the one hand, there was the dissidents that I talk about, but there was also a great deal uh, of self-pity, of uh, a sense of uh, empire under attack, um, a sense of British righteousness in India imperiled. Um, when the Morant Bay Rebellion happens in 1865, uh, the British mainstream press is very quick to seize on the resonances between what happens in Morant Bay and what happens in India. But what happens in Morant Bay is, of course, uh, on a much smaller scale, both geographically and in terms of time. Now, this is a very, very different kind of rebellion uh, from what happens uh, in India. The Indian one is still quite in Kuwait, um, and there are you know, different interests playing, uh, uh, and, you know, and not necessarily all coherent uh, in, in the Indian scene. In Morant Bay, it's a very specific, kind of rebellion. What we have are um, freed slaves. So uh, if you think about emancipation, full emancipation takes place in 1838. And 25 years on, nearly 30 years on, um, the those who are freed slaves and those who are descended from freed slaves find themselves in an economically very shabby uh, and very um, uh, precarious situation because although they've been emancipated from slavery, they have not been offered um, any way of really carving out a meaningful freedom for themselves. So in a sense, what they're coming to a realization of is that emancipation has been a kind of freedom in name only. And you have uh, the planter class continuing, of course, uh, and also continuing with the help of indentured labor. This is something we don't uh, talk about in Britain very much. When uh, slavery was ended, not only were slave owners compensated, they were given an alternative source of labor from India and China in the form of indentured labor. Um, free black communities were basically left to their own devices. Sorry, were you going to ask a question? Yeah, uh, just just for our audience, because often they probably yeah. hear that they probably hear the term indentured labor so frequently. But can you just briefly um, explain the difference between indentured labor and slavery? Well, indentured labor is technically uh, free labor. Uh, those who come uh, as indentured labor are essentially signing documents which say that they will work off their passage and then they will return uh, once they have made money and worked off their passage and paid their passage back, they will return 
uh, to India or or wherever as they choose. But in point of fact, uh, they're never a, the the wages are so pitiful and the living conditions um, are so bad that almost uh, uh, none of them is really able to uh, earn enough money to pay their passage back, uh, let alone make make money from the endeavor. So what you have is technically free labor uh, who have come uh, to the Caribbean on their own device uh, of their own volition as opposed to slaves, but in fact find themselves in conditions which are not significantly economically different from that of slavery. I mean, it is very important to stress that these are not slaves. They have come there uh, because they've signed documents saying they will come to the Caribbean and work plantations. Um, but their conditions, uh, in fact, be, end up being extremely poor, which is why uh, we have large uh, communities of uh, Indian and Chinese descent in the Caribbean islands today, because they are the descendants of indentured labor who were not able to go back, um, despite having thought that they would come back, make money, pay off their passage and return to their um, uh, villages in due course. So you just briefly identified there this kind of uh what was quite explicitly overtly talked about as a continuation of of a kind of not slavery but servitude uh by people in the west indies from the 1830s through to the 1860s they quite explicitly say without land they aren't free in a in a meaningful sense this then culminates in this rebellion uh the morant bay rebellion and it's led by quite a remarkable gentleman isn't it he's a He's a mixed race businessman, politician. Can you explain a little bit about uh, the story of um, George? Uh, God, I've forgotten his name now. George William George Gordon. William Gordon. Yeah. I'd only heard yeah. of him. I'd only heard of him uh, two days ago. You know, and I thought, what yeah. a remarkable. Yeah, yeah. We're having this conversation about statues. My God, we should have one to George William Gordon. George Gordon, yes. And of course, they have statues to him um, in Jamaica um, itself. Um, George William Gordon is an interesting figure. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that I would describe him as a leader, but he was clearly uh, an inspiration uh, to those who rebelled. Now, the uh, short version of the rebellion is that these are descendants of freed slaves or freed slaves themselves in, in some cases. Uh, demanding that their freedom be made meaningful and that they have the right to farm small plots of land where they can be genuinely free. And the, and the most important thing I, I think about the rebellion is that they do not want to work as wage laborers on mm. plantation. It is a kind of uh, early and unambiguous refusal of mercantile capitalism. It is a refusal of work um, as a condition of freedom. Um, what uh, what these re uh, rebels want is the right to just basically be self-sufficient, to, to look after their own plots of land, to make uh, enough vegetables or, or products to sell, uh, to feed themselves and to make money for their families. They do not want to work for planters. And wage labor is a condition that they explicitly compare to slavery, which I think is uh, very, very interesting. Ha having undergone slavery, they see mm. nothing emancipatory about becoming uh, wage labor. So the rebellion is really about the conditions in which the so-called freed slaves find themselves. Um, George William Gordon is, imp is important because he's a kind of in-between figure. He is what was then known as a colored man. He had a, a white father and a black mother. He was educated. He had a white uh, wife. Um, and he was a politician and a businessman. So this made him a kind of dangerous figure because on the one hand, he wasn't a, a slave or descended directly from slaves. Um, he was not destitute, he was not poor, but he was also educated, which meant that he had a voice in the Jamaican legislature that the, uh, you know, the ordinary rebels, the ordinary uh, uh, black peasantry did not. But what was also interesting about him is that where he might have thrown his lot behind the white owning classes, because he belonged to the owning classes, he in fact threw his lot behind the black peasantry. And he practiced a form of Christianity, which was practiced largely by black peasantry. Um, and he was very, very explicit in throwing his uh, political and cultural allegiances behind the black peasantry. So he became a kind of, um, I would say, a kind of um, a figure around whom organizing took place rather than someone who was necessarily a leader, although he did um, address meetings, although he did help write petitions and he did 
uh, participate in discussions around uh, how the British crown should be petitioned. Um, so he is a kind of very articulate figure who is not white, uh, but also not wholly black and therefore deeply threatening uh, to the white colonial regime in Jamaica. And the consequence of this is that when the rebellion does take place, uh, and of course it is brutally crushed like every other rebellion, uh, he is arrested even though he was nowhere on scene. He is at home. He is sick with uh, some kind of flu, um, but he is arrested, uh, taken to Morant Bay, and uh, after a very short and shambolic military trial, a court martial, uh, he is hanged. And his hanging, when news reaches England of his hanging, it creates enormous unease and it creates a huge controversy that came to be known um, as the Jamaica Affair or the Governor Eyre Controversy. And it resulted in Governor Eyre being recalled from Jamaica, uh, brought back to England, uh, put on trial uh, to a private prosecution. Um, be, because uh, he wasn't prosecuted by the government. And so we have the uh, the Jamaica committee, which consists of kind of uh, various liberal figures of the day who are very uneasy about uh, Gordon's execution, who are very uneasy about what happens in Jamaica in the name of the British people, and decide that they will make an example of air. And that controversy, I, I talk about it in the book, um, as an exemplary moment of the emergence of fault lines around empire, uh, those who are uh, incredibly uneasy at what is being done mm. in the name of the British people, in the name of the empire. Yeah, the people who were involved in the, the Jamaica committee, it's kind of like a who's who at the time of, uh, of, of British liberalism. You've got John Bright, who I believe was the MP for Birmingham, quite yes. a critical figure in the Second Reform Act. You've got Charles Darwin, uh, John Stuart Mill, Thomas Huxley, yes. Thomas Hughes, Herbert Spencer. I mean, these are these are huge names in British public life going yeah. to bat for a mixed race man who was they view as being illegally um, executed by by a very senior official. I mean, most yeah. people now, if you were to say to, to, to the average person in the street, this happened in the 1860s, they they probably wouldn't think that happened. Was that was that a surprise that such big names took that step? Was it a kind of break with the cultural status quo? Because these were people with serious cultural capital. Uh, like yes. I say, going to bat for somebody thousands of miles away that they'd, they'd never yes. met. Yes, and it created a great deal of upset within the kind of British establishment because it actually broke friendships. Um, so on the one hand, you have people like uh, John Stuart Mill and John Bright on the side of Gordon who want to see air prosecuted. On the other side, you have people like Tennyson, the poet, um, and Ruskin, uh, you know, regarded as a great public intellectual, who form what is known as the air committee, who pay for air to defend himself, who are furious with their friends, with their liberal friends, for going to bat for uh, uh, George Gordon. Um, one important thing is that it is not just the British establishment that, uh, or one side of the British establishment that is mm. going to bat for Gordon. Um, what is really interesting, and this is talked about, I think, a lot less in relation to the uh, controversy in Britain, there are working class meetings around what has happened to Gordon. Um, and you have different uh, working class groups uh, and newspapers like Reynolds newspaper and the Beehive, which also organize public meetings, which are also attended by kind of liberal MPs, uh, radical MPs, uh, who also condemn what is happening, what has happened in Jamaica in relation to George Gordon. And what is interesting to me there is that where the liberals are not explicitly necessarily addressing race, the working class meetings explicitly address the question of race. And um, you have at various points, and I detail this in the chapter, you at various points, you have people who are addressing the meeting saying, you know, the black man and the white working class man are, are oppressed by the same people. And don't think that just because something happened to a black man far away in Jamaica, they won't do it to you here just because you're white. Um, and I find it really interesting that there is a call, a very explicit call to transracial solidarity uh, because working people will be oppressed by the same uh, formation, whether in Jamaica or whether in Britain. Um, so where the liberals are often talking in very mealy-mouthed constitutional terms, 
working class meetings are much more explicit about talking about oppression, about talking about the consequences of letting the owning classes in Britain get away uh, with the murder of, uh, of, of George Gordon uh, and of the consequences of uh, not saying anything just because it was uh, a man of color uh, who was killed and, and not a white man. And I found, I, and I think that what's what's happening here is that with the uh, with people like John Stuart Mill, uh, there is a slow process of trying to contain uh, hmm. what has happened and trying to address it through constitutional means. Whereas the working class meetings are, as you might expect, much more agitational and much more angry about what has happened in Jamaica uh, in the name of of uh, British people, British working people. Yeah, a lot of the uh, a lot of the material that you um, sort of engage with uh, in that part of the book for me it's probably the best part of the book because I was sort of multiple times out loud going, "Wow, that's incredible! That's inc you know, it's just inspiring." Uh, and and there were again quite explicit statements saying, "Well, the fact we have these colonies, these possessions overseas, isn't good for working people here because it means that you know our wages are effectively depressed," which was a, yeah. again a quite a remarkable yeah. thing to be articulating yeah. 150 years ago. Uh, and Reynolds News, I mean, you said that in the case of the sort of responses to the Indian mutiny and so on with the Chartists, that these weren't huge influences. But Reynolds News in, in the 1860s, 1870s, that had a, a readership of, of a couple of hundred thousand. I mean, this was this was a this was now becoming a serious part of the national conversation, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I mean, I think more so than we give credit for. Um, I think quite often the uh, literature that I look at in the book, it's the kind of thing that's dismissed by mainstream historians as marginal. Uh, but I think marginal is what you make marginal. Um, and I, I, I don't think that newspapers like uh, Reynolds, um, in its heyday, the People's Paper, or even the Beehive, which is a, a trades union journal, um, are to be dismissed as negligible. I think what has happened is that they've been pushed out of the frame of national discussion. But they are, as you just said, they're absolutely part uh, of the national discussion. And what it teaches us uh, above all else, um, as you just pointed out, is that ideas which we would consider very contemporary um, have actually been around in the British public sphere for uh, well over a century. And, and in fact, things that we might think now uh, were articulated as early as 1857. Yeah, particularly relevant in a, in a context of Black Lives Matter and uh, yeah. calls to, to transracial solidarity. Uh, we're going to yeah. fast forward, uh, well, multiple decades. Uh, yeah. And again, this is something which is really not re well known in, in British history. Uh, the first, we would say, BAME uh, MP uh, in British Parliament was a gentleman called, I hope I don't kill his first name here, Sapurji Sakla. Saklatvala, I knew this, the second bit. Uh, now, he was uh, not born in Britain. He came here a little bit later in life. Uh, he was elected as an MP for Battersea North, I believe, the first time yep. in 1922. Yep. Gets re-elected yep. in, what, 24 and stays till 29. So a, a reasonably long parliamentary career for somebody who, for most of it, was a member of the Communist Party. Um, can you sort of talk about this gentleman? Because a bit like uh, you were talking ab about with um, with George, he had the ability to kind of speak to two audiences simultaneously. When he said us, he wasn't just referring to uh, the British electorate, the people that voted him, put him into Westminster, but also for people in South Asia. Yeah, Saklatwala is in fact, believe it or not, the third Indian MP. Um, uh, there were two before him. One was um, Dada Bhai Nauroji, who was a liberal, and uh, sorry, he was the second, and the first was um, um, Man, uh, Bhaunagri, who was a Tory. Um, Saklatwala was the third. He was also the third Parsi uh, MP. Oh, I didn't know um, that. Yes, uh, it is interesting uh, that the early uh, sort of Asian politicians are all uh, Indian Parsis. Um, the important thing about Saklatwala is that he comes from uh, a, a wealthy industrialist family in India, but he is himself a poor relation. So he didn't uh, grow up with a whole lot of money, but he has close uh, connections with the Tata family. Mm. Um, and the interesting thing is that I believe uh, that the descendants, some of the descendants of the Saklatwala family, some of Shapuji Saklatwala's descendants, um, still work uh, for the Tatars. So there is a kind of uh, uh, an odd connection to the industrialist 
uh, family, but this is, if you like, the radical and, and more uh, less wealthy wing of that family. Saklatwala comes to Britain uh, under circumstances we're not entirely clear about. We are uh, led to believe that he might have been uh, a bit too agitational for his family's comfort. And so he gets shuffled off to Britain, um, he, but he was also uh, uh, quite not well. So he comes to Britain for medical treatment. He meets um, an English woman. He marries her. They settle down. They have a family. Um, he initially gets involved with the uh, uh, Independent Labour Party. Uh, it, it's a formation not very many people in Britain know about today, but um, it was uh, an, an, an independent formation that eventually merged uh, into the Labour Party as we currently know it. Um, Saklatwala begins uh, as an independent Labour Party uh, member. He gets increasingly involved in trades union activism and uh, workers uh, groups, uh, particularly international, you know, groups for international workers. Um, he then, uh, I think, joins the Communist Party in 1919 um, and stands uh, initially as a Labour MP. And then, of course, uh, when Labour uh, pushes the communists out, he then uh, stands separately um, as a communist candidate. Uh, now, the thing about Saklatwala that is interesting is, and, and I talk about him largely in these terms, is that he's a kind of interpreter uh, between India and Britain. But he is an interpreter of kind of radical movements. And he's trying to kind of, in his own terms, uh, get the British working classes and the Indian working classes to forge common cause. Um, and it is quite remarkable to read his interventions in Parliament. They are, they are fiery, they are uh, incredibly upfront and frank about the workings of the establishment, not just in Britain, but also mm. um, as the nationalist movement in India, which has a very, very strong uh, Indian uh, middle class and industrialist base. So he's very critical. And this is what makes him an interesting figure. He's critical both of British colonialism and aspects of Indian nationalism, even though he sees himself in one mm. sense uh, mm. an Indian nationalist. So I find his kind of uh, his ability to, to look in two directions and try to make the two sides talk to each other particularly interesting. And did he provoke a particularly reactionary response, that like fella? Because, you know, this is a this is an Indian man uh, representing uh, primarily, you know, white seat. Uh, yeah. But it seems, I mean, it's kind of, again, it's one of those remarkable things. We just talked about, you know, the uh, the committee that was responding to the Moran Bay Rebellion and so on. I mean, this seems in, in many ways even more remarkable. You know, if you told the average person 100 years ago, a, a person born in India was elected as an MP by an almost university white electorate, they, they simply wouldn't have believed you. Was there, was there any sort of racialized kickback or do we have to actually look to more sort of recent decades to find that? There is certainly some racialized kickback. Um, uh, we certainly have evidence of um, kind of racialized comments in Parliament uh, coming, as you might imagine, mm. uh, largely from the Tory benches. Um, there's this snide remarks. There are uh, thinly veiled racist uh, sneers. Um, I have seen letters in his papers, which are preserved in the British Library, which we would uh, compare to, you know, present day hate mail that right. uh, you know, MPs, black MPs and, and MPs of color get. So it's not entirely absent. But equally, I think we should, as you just did, uh, note that it is not true that a hundred years ago, everybody was OK with racism or that everybody was racist. He was, as you say. Um, elected in a, uh, a ward with significant numbers of white people, although, it, you know, you, you did have, he was assisted, um, for instance, by uh, Arnold Ward, uh, who was a black politician. Um, so there were also immigrant uh, communities and communities of color uh, in, in Battersea. But what you do see is evidence that it isn't always the case that there was back in the day uh, unrelenting racism, which would have made it impossible for a black or Asian person to be uh, an, an MP in Britain. I don't actually see any evidence that Saklatwala's position uh, was significantly different from what MPs of color today have to deal with, which is a mixture of uh, a white voter base um, and 
you know, predictable hate mail. Uh, you do not get a picture of unrelenting racism. Um, I've seen letters from white constituents, which are deeply grateful, uh, which regard him as a, as a wonderful constituency MP. Um, so again, I think the picture, uh, you know, 100 years ago is as complex and, and diverse as we, we see it today. I think as well, what really presses at home for me is the fact he was a, a communist. Yeah. You know, again, yeah. again it's just a completely sort of dissenting politics, the status quo, a, a person of colour. And, and you know, the reaction, like you say, wasn't that different to what we see today for actually quite vanilla social democratic politicians in many ways. You think if somebody yeah. was that who was that politically conspicuous was on the scene today as an MP, you know, if anything, I think they'd perhaps get worse treatment. Or I'm not familiar with the, the, the correspondence yeah. he was receiving. Yeah. I mean, one thing, of course, it is worth noting is that we are talking the 1920s when, uh, you know, the Bolshevik revolution still has its, uh, it's still covered in, in glory. Um, and it, it still has a kind of very profound effect across uh, different political formations. Um, but you also start to see, of course, the Labour Party's anti-communism kick in very quickly. Uh, Saklatwala, even when he's serving as, an, as a, as a Labour MP, will frequently turn around and make critical comments about his own ventures, about, about his fellow Labour MPs. Um, but you do see that the discussion of working class rights, the discussion uh, of uh, revolutionary action, uh, the discussion of uh, socialism as an idea uh, actually is in a way less tainted uh, and less easily uh, dismissed and sneered at than it is today. Um, it still has uh, in a sense, the the glory of the heady days of um, of 1918, 1917, 1918, and and that I think Saklatwala is able to parlay in in good ways, uh, at least in the early part of his career. I'd like to talk a little bit again, moving these are many, many decades ahead. Uh, uh, Labour MPs who really situated themselves in opposition to Britain's continued presence in, in Kenya uh, in the 1950s. I mean, the historic one for me is obviously Barbara Castle. Uh, yeah. but, but can you can you talk a little bit about uh, the responses to what was at the time called the Mama uprising after after really 1950, uh, all the way through to, to 1960? I think Kenya gets independence in 1963. Um, what what was that like? Because obviously it was a very very bloody uprising. It wasn't as bad as uh, as the French in Algeria, but you know we know perhaps more than a million people were uh, arbitrarily detained. Uh, perhaps more than a hundred thousand people died. Uh, the numbers are very uh, uncertain because it turns out a British colonial office destroyed destroyed them all in nineteen sixty three. So for a Labour MP to be championing a cause which was as violent, I mean, there's, there's no other word for it, on both sides, obviously f the repression was far yeah. worse from the British. Yeah. That was a very brave decision to make for a Labour MP in the 1950s, wasn't it? Yes, I mean, uh, you know, what we have in Labour, and I think we will recognise uh, this formation uh, in the present day as well, you have uh, Labour MPs who situate themselves in a critical side, in an oppositional side, uh, of the Labour Party. And uh, the two names that spring out um, in relation to Kenya uh, are uh, Barbara Castle, as you mentioned, and Fena Brockway. Fena Brockway, like Saklatwala, uh, was a member of the uh, independent Labour Party before it merged um, into the Labour Party. And Brockway is very interesting because he's not uh, a communist. He is not uh, really uh, what we might regard as a radical. He is he's definitely left of center. He's definitely uh, to the left of the Labour Party's center. Um, now, Brockway and uh, Barbara Castle, along with uh, a, a, a number of dissident MPs in the Labour Party, situate themselves as critics of what is going on in Kenya. Uh, Brockway had long-term ties uh, with uh, different African leaders. He was, of course, close to Nehru and Gandhi, but he was also uh, friends with Nkrumah and Kenyatta. And what you start to see in the immediate post-war period is uh, after India uh, gains independence in 1947, Brockway turns his attention to what is happening in East Africa or, or what becomes present-day Kenya and, and Uganda and Tanzania. Um, 
In the case of the uh, Mao Mao movement, what is important, I think, when it comes to both Brockway and Castle, neither of them will ambiguously throw in their lot with the insurgency. So they will never say, uh, for instance, that the Mao Mao are justified or that uh, the Mao Mao were not violent. They uh, repeatedly will talk about the brutalities and even uh, use the word savagery in relation to Mao Mao, but they will uh, really as a consequence of travel in Kenya, Brockway makes two visits to Kenya uh, Castle, of course, uh, is sent there by the Mirror newspaper to investigate what is going on in the British detention camps. Um, now, while neither of them will unambiguously throw in their lot with the insurgency, both are very, very clear that the ferocious counterinsurgency that takes place during the emergency years uh, in the early 1950s uh, was unacceptable, and that what was being done in Britain's name uh, and using uh, Mao Mao as an excuse was unacceptable. And this, again, strikes me as uh, incredibly brave, because even today, uh, you will get people uh, tut tutting about Mao Mao, um, but not really saying very much about both the uh, really deeply oppressive nature of the white settler presence in Kenya, uh, the fact that uh, Kenyan rebels across the political spectrum, whether they were Mao Mao or whether they considered themselves uh, more moderate, um, very few people will say they had um, just cause. And Brockway does say uh, they have just cause, that what is being done in Kenya uh, is unacceptable, and what was being done in the name of the counterinsurgency uh, was also unacceptable. Barbara Castle is quite amazing. She goes there not as an as a parliamentary uh, MP, but she goes there as a journalist sent there, uh, paid for by the Mirror, um, and she undertakes uh, a series of investigative reports, which come back um, and cause controversy back in Britain because she does report on the naked racism and the brutal violence. Uh, of the counterinsurgency, the jailing, the torture, the detentions, the punitive tactics. Um, and this then results in uh, the Kenya situation becoming a big uh, uh, source of conflict in parliament. And reading those parliamentary debates are really fascinating because you do have the emergence of parliamentary uh, criticism of uh, British imperial rule in Kenya. And that is coming at the instigation of people like Brockway Castle and their allies in the Labour Party. With Barbara Castle, you have quite clear articulations of, of Britain's uh, colonial apparatus in Kenya is similar to that of, of Nazi Germany. I mean, she says that, those are her, those are her words. A few decades earlier, you have, again, quite explicit comparisons made by people like George Padmore, uh, Padmore CLR James and so on, about yeah. the kind of apparatus that's being used in uh, Ethiopia by the Italians, uh, Britain and its colonies, what's then used by the Germans in the Second World War. They, they basically see these as on a, on a, on a spectrum, you know, of, yeah. of, of, of colonial kind of settler violence and white supremacist violence. What, why have we lost that tradition? I mean, if you were to go out, mm -hmm. to, if you were to go on the television or, you know, G Good Morning Britain and talk to Piers Morgan and you say, well, actually, you know, uh, a parliamentarian, a quite, quite senior one, actually, at the time, quite explicitly drew uh, connections between, you know, Nazi Germany and our behaviour in Kenya 10, 15 years later, you'd be shouted down. Why do you think we've lost sight of that? Yes, I mean, you don't have to even look at Good Morning Britain. I think on Channel 4 uh, a few weeks ago, uh, someone raised, uh, I forget who the speaker was, but someone raised the uh, relationship between fascism and colonialism. It was very quickly shut down uh, by the presenter. Uh, it's not something you can say in, in the British public sphere at all today. Um, that is, of course, a consequence of the very successful binary between bad fascists, that is Germany and Italy, um, and the good allies uh, whose colonial track record we don't talk about. Mm. But in the 1930s and going into the uh, period in the late 1940s, early 1950s, this is not at all unusual on the 
colonial uh, left. Uh, people like Fenner Brockway, who edits the New Leader, which is a kind of uh, independent Labour Party newspaper, um, are regularly hosting writers like C.L.R. James and George Padmore. And George Padmore writes, I would say, probably 10 articles, all talking about the links between uh, fascist techniques in Europe and colonial techniques in Africa. And he's, you know, and he will meticulously draw out comparisons between detention camps, mm. uh, punitive mm. regimes, racist laws, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So actually, we do have a moment in Britain in the uh, 30s, 40s, uh, when these comparisons were not outlandish, uh, where mm. in fact, uh, thinking about colonialism, thinking about fascism, uh, not making necessarily a stark binary between the good allies and the and the bad axis, uh, was not uh, uh, taken for granted. So when Barbara Castle goes to Kenya and sees what is operative there, um, the comparison with concentration camps, I think, comes quite naturally to her. What are you seeing? You're seeing a racialized population mm. put into barbed wire camps in terrible conditions and dying in very large numbers. Uh, either they're executed um, or they die of starvation or torture. So for her, that comparison, I think, uh, was kind of self-evident uh, in a way that for us now, because now we are not engaging with the terrain of history, we are now squarely in the terrain of mythology. And that mythology insists that we keep this kind of uh, good, bad binary going and frankly don't talk about the empire. So yeah, I mean, the, the kind of fascism and colonialism and the relationship between the two uh, uh, would have been something very, very natural uh, for critics of the empire to talk about in the, in the 40s. To what extent do you think that that could change, obviously, with the kind of political moment which surrounds Black Lives Matter? Um, and, and to what extent do you think it's possible to begin to articulate the connections between colonialism and, and fascism and how they're constituted historically uh, through hatred of the other, um, but particularly uh, hatred of the, sort of the, the non-European or the non-white? Uh, and it, it seems like it, it could be relatively easy to do because you know i was i was reading a little bit about the sort of um the extent the attempted extermination of the herero tribe by by imperial germany in the early 1900s and again it's 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 just so obviously uh a, a sort of um, an antecedent kind of uh, uh technological military political moment to what they then try uh with the final solution in, in europe uh, between 1939 and 1945, that it, it again, it kind of seems kind of implausible to not draw that connection. Do you, do you think we now have an opportunity to do that? I saw you tweet the other day. I think you said, "I want to leave uh, Britain," uh, and, and the book is actually sort of like an encomium to the the history of British descent, and it's actually quite optimistic in its own way. So I found that an interesting yeah. point point to make. Uh, what do you think mm. about the chances of, of of taking the present political moment and injecting it with that historical knowledge? Okay, well, there are two separate questions. I mean, let me just kind of contextualize my tweet. I mean, it was a moment of exasperation. And I, I think, no, but it, it, it for me, it's quite uh, poignant because my home country, uh, India, does have a fascist regime mm. uh, in uh, uh, in power, people don't see the connections. Uh, but in fact, to anybody who has been studying India for the uh, and Indian history for the last seventy years, uh, understands quite clearly that we have descendants of explicitly fascist formations in power in India today. So if I left Britain, my choice would be to go back to a place where fascists uh, are in power. Um, so. Yes, that 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 tweet uh, raises the question of where would one go in 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 the present conjuncture, which is grim, uh, you know, whichever direction mm. you look at. Do we have a, an opportunity now in Britain? Yes, we have an opportunity, and yes, I wrote the book as an encomium to a different kind of thought tradition, a different kind of activist tradition. But I'm afraid we're going to need a lot more honesty in public discourse in Britain, which is deeply dishonest. Um, we are going to need much more courage across the political spectrum to engage with the complexities of empire and its relationship to fascism. 
Um, I, I should say here that I, I would, you know, despite having uh, talked about the connections, they are uh, Nazi Germany and the British Empire are very, very specific historical formations that have their own specific operations. Uh, what was interesting to me about people like James and Pat Moore is that they were fiercely anti-fascist. Uh, they gave no quarter to Italy or Germany, um, and they were absolutely behind anti-fascist organizing, but they nonetheless drew the connections between fascism and some of the operations of the British Empire. It isn't like they were giving quarter uh, to fascists by making these comparisons. I think today uh, there is perhaps more fear that if we talk about the connections, then we're uh, somehow giving fascism a free pass. And I, and I would say that no, uh, one doesn't give fascism a free pass, uh, but nor does one uh, allow imperialism and its descendants uh, a free pass. I think that that conversation is being opened up by BLM. Mm. Um, I'm a bit nervous that it, we will go back to kind of simplistic uh, standpoints uh, rather than have the difficult discussion. And I do, to the, I do think that in, in, in the 1930s and 40s, more difficult discussions were happening, certainly in progressive and liberal quarters, than we seem to be prepared to have now. I hope it's an opportunity. I think it's been giving, given to us in a sense uh, it's the, the the door has been opened, but I think we have to uh, grab it and we have to grab it in a sustained way um, because it, we are in it for the long haul uh, if we want to change the conversation. Just the final question. Um, to what extent do you think colonialism explains a number of aspects of, of contemporary British culture? Uh, one example of this is, um, you know, the, I remember the whole shoot to kill argument around terrorism. Uh, and again, that was a that was a, 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 a you know that was a, a, a sequence of words used in, in regards to the Mama uprising or the yeah. Malayan emergency, shoot to kill. Um, are we immersed in terms of, of British culture? We're really still immersed in the legacy of colonialism here Absolutely. in Britain today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no there's no doubt about that. So even our discussions about policing, um, when you had uh, you know uh, lots of Brits and and lots of kind of very right on Brits saying, well, you can't compare us to America. Uh, the point is, well, actually, we can not only because uh, you know there are uh, uh, there are policing uh, there's police violence here in Britain in the present day, but because policing and counterinsurgency, as we know it, and of course the two things are completely wrapped up in the colonial mm -hmm. context. Policing was counterinsurgency. Counterinsurgency was policing. Uh, British policing is deeply tied up with colonial policing. And until we kind of reckon with that legacy in which it is, in fact, perfectly normal to profile uh, black people and brown people and, Mus and you know, Muslims or, you know, whatever religion uh, uh, might, might be targeted in, in a particular colony, um, you know, profiling, surveillance, uh, shoot to kill, detention, uh, uh, you know, versions of torture or, or physical, uh, 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 you know, um, violence, these are all coming to us very directly from the colonial context. And until we engage with that uh, legacy, uh, there is probably not going to be much uh, radical change. Even with multiculturalism, you, you raise this in the book, you know, the idea that you negotiate community relations with particular elevated individuals who are representative of obviously much larger heterogeneous, heterogeneous bodies. Uh, you know, that's how Blair and New Labour did, you know, multicultural um, sort of formation, social sort of, sort of the building of social bonds. Again, that comes out of sort of colonial era as well, doesn't it? It absolutely does. I mean, I do think that, you know, uh, one would want to, in one sense, defend multiculturalism from the right wing uh, attack of it. But on the other hand, it is also true that multiculturalism has become a, a bit of simplistic affair where you appoint chiefs. Um, and then you rush off and you talk to the chiefs uh, about, you know, what a community wants. I mean, one example of this is that when it comes to dealing with British Indians, uh, specifically British Hindus, uh, successive British governments, Blair as well as uh, the Tories today, uh, engage with the most retrograde, uh, most, uh, let us say, um, hardline 
uh, Hindu leaders uh, who, for instance, have stopped caste legislation from coming to the table uh, in on in Parliament. And what do they say? They say, well, if you allow caste legislation, legislation against caste equality to come to the table, then you will be hurting the sentiments of British Hindus. Uh, and what that means is that you know power within the communities. So, for instance, caste power within, which is very ferocious, very powerful within British Indian communities, uh, that just gets pushed out of the frame because it's been decided that uh, these retrograde leaders can speak for the communities. And I think we have to be very attentive to that uh, when we talk about uh, you know colonialism and decolonization. Priya, that was a fantastic interview. I enjoyed your book very much. Um, it's out in all good bookshops. Now they're open again. I mean, I probably would suggest people buy it on the Verso website. It's probably the best place, right? Yes, probably. Yes, yes. And no, not Amazon. Definitely not Amazon. Definitely not. Okay. Thank Thanks for joining for us. Thank you. Bye.